Thank you for the super chat, Sean Matthew. He asks, why is it okay to privately study history and come to the magisterium, but not okay to privately study history and come to the canon of Scripture? Yeah, and, and I wouldn't frame it in terms of okay, like what is morally acceptable or non-acceptable. This does come to an important point when we discuss the canon, because Protestants will often say, look, if you need an infallible interpreter to know what Scripture is, then don't you need an infallible interpreter to know what the magisterium is, that you're just kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're, you, you can't fallibly come to the canon. You need an infallible backstop. I'm not a big fan of those particular kinds of arguments. Rather, the argument that I make is more of an evidential quality to it. Um, it's not about private judgment. It's about when we look at the evidence uh, that has been given to us historically, whether it comes in canonical written texts, non-canonical written texts, traditions, what the fathers have recorded, um, what authority did Christ and the apostles give us? And so if your claim is that the authority they gave us are these 66 books, mm -hmm. and for simplicity, we'll say the 27 books of the New Testament canon to be the, the primary norm for the church— well, why? What is the chain of reasoning that gets you to these 27 books? And to me, the chain of reasoning is always flawed, uh, that it starts with the conclusion of the 27 and then tries to find criteria to uh, to show, yes, here's why, because they're apostolic or because they correspond to Old Testament. And you'll come up with all this criteria after the fact that's arbitrary and doesn't even explain why this collection and not another. Whereas if you look at the historical data, seeing the role of sacred tradition, of inspired writings without necessarily a definitive canon, and the teaching office of the bishops or the successors of the apostles, there is just more evidence for that, that paradigm for authority than just for going straight to the canon of scripture. So that is why when I, if someone were to ask me that, I don't try to make the private judgment is bad argument or an infallibility chain argument. I think it's more helpful just to make a modest evidential argument and say which claim has more evidence to it. That's why I did my episode at the beginning of the week on Monday, where I looked through the fathers before Irenaeus, showing that they really don't treat the New Testament like we would expect if they considered it the sole infallible rule of faith. They, they hardly treat it as a, as a rule of faith at all, frankly. Yeah, it seems like we take the same position when it comes to the evidentialist perspective on, on, on proving the Catholic case here. Yeah. You know, speaking about the canon, I thought it was interesting the way he referred to some of the difficulties that Protestants have on the right. canon. He referred to the fuzzy edges. <laughs> I thought well, <laughs> it's the fuzzy edges problem that is the very reason why we offer this argument. Right. If, you, if you're calling an inability to really decide whether some books are inspired by God or not, not just fuzzy edges. I think you've kind of conceded. Well, problem. and some of these are really important. Like you say, oh, well, it's just Hebrews and James and Revelation, as it, there was in the early church and even among the Protestant reformers. There are critical doctrines in those books. I mean, imagine if someone just told, well, and this came up with Swan a little bit in my discussion with him that I would love to bring up in the debate, which also comes to a, a double standard why I did my New Testament video recently, is that... Uh, Protestants will often say, ah, oh, Catholics make these claims about the early bishops and Bishop of Rome. And But if you read modern scholarship, oh, if you read the oracles of modern scholarship, you'll see Catholic claims about early Catholic doctrine or the episcopacy or the primacy of Rome. But the modern scholars just don't, don't agree with that. Oh, that's just Catholic apologetics right there. And yet those same Protestant apologists will unquestioningly hold that Paul wrote the pastoral letters. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll hold, you know, they'll hold that the New Testament canon was known in the early second century church uh, uniformly. Uh, and yet modern scholars, uh, if you ask most modern biblical scholars, they'll say that especially among like the pastoral letters where you get the important teachings on Sola Scriptura, they're, they're, they really don't believe that Paul wrote those letters or that Peter wrote second Peter, uh, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, so it's a very, uh, uh, pick, a, pick and choose among them, use the scholars to bludgeon the Catholics, and then when their same arguments go after Protestant doctrine, like Michael Kruger has said flat out, his model for the canon 
is a minority view among biblical scholars about canon formation. But Protestants will cite him because they really like his conclusion. A self-authenticating canon that gets you around the canon question easily, mm -hmm. although I would say it gets you there in a fallacious way. So, um, yeah, w w when I look at that, and I apologize, Michael, my, tr my train of thought has jumped the tracks. No, I you're fine. This is I great. Hope, I hope I'm still sticking to the original no, this is good. question. But, yeah, yeah so yeah. That, if, if I went through there. What was the question again? <laughs> so, I mean, effectively, he was talking about the fuzzy edges. Of oh, the yes, canon, yes, yes. And, and it's like that. That's a. But there's issue. so many. <laughs> and they act, they act like, oh, well, it's not really a problem. We all basically yeah. agree. But what if you just let critical scholars set the terms If they mm -hmm. said, you know what? Only that which is from the apostles is uh, canonical. You would lose a lot of Paul's letters. You could lose aspects of the Gospels like the Jesus seminar would tear that apart. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, as I brought up in the debate, you have textual issues. Is the woman caught in adultery? Is that scripture? It seemed to be accepted as scripture at the Council of Trent, but you have Protestant Bibles that omit it. Uh, so, I mean, it's it, the canon questions. If you let the camel's nose under the tent uh, to define what it is, it is a much more difficult question than they would make it out to be. Yeah, especially when it's entire books like Esther, for instance. So, yeah, you know, the Old Testament. I, I, I wouldn't call that a fuzzy edge. Yeah, I mean, and what would you this say? Book yeah, what would you say to, to Protestants to say to, to Gavin? Look, modern scholars, almost all of them agree that uh, Hebrews is an anonymous work. So why don't you just get rid of it? But they're not going to jettison Hebrews from the canon. It has very important doctrines. Many of those, oh, yeah. once again, are doctrines that are used to hit Catholics over the head about yeah. the sacrifice of the mass. Oh, once for all sacrifice. And, mm -hmm. you know, quoting Hebrews over and over again. And he perfects all, Hebrews 7.25. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do if someone just said, yeah, I believe in scripture just only if it comes from an apostle we don't know where hebrews comes from if yeah. you say well there's a tradition that it's apostolic mm -hmm. now you've opened up the tradition can of worms yeah in, in the criteria of it has to be written by an apostle or apostolic men somebody related to an apostle well right that's even not consistently applied in certain cases right origin like said yeah yeah origin said only god knows who wrote who wrote hebrews <laughs> uh and you're right it could lead into why not first clement especially yeah. if it was written as I think it was written in the late sixties, yeah, absolutely. Then we have someone who is firmly connected or with the, the apostles or the Didache too. Or I mean, the Didache, it's yeah. just like that doesn't work for me. So here, here's hey the everybody, I hope you enjoyed this highlight clip. If you want to see the full interview, go to the description of this video and you'll see a link to the full thing. And by the way, hit the like button and the subscribe button. And if you want to support me at Reason and Theology, go to Patreon.com forward slash Reason and Theology. Thank you and God bless.